choose both fascinating and confusing, and perhaps you do too. Uh, this will be a very interesting and informative session, so I'm glad you have joined us here today. This webinar is offered by Kids with Food Allergies as part of its educational outreach program. I'm Linda Mitchell, Senior Vice President at the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America, or AFA. Kids with Food Allergies is a division of AFA. I have the privilege of being your moderator this afternoon. Today's webinar is made possible through a sponsorship by Sanofi. We rely on donors and corporate partners like Sanofi for the financial support that enables us to develop educational programs for families. Guest presenters for all of our webinars are doing so as volunteers without compensation. They also prepare their presentations independently from us. On behalf of AFA and KFA, I'm very grateful for the Allergy Law Project to donate their time to be here with us today. Legal issues are so interesting but also complicated complicated for us non-attorneys to fully understand. The Allergy Law Project attorneys will walk us through some of these key legal concepts and recent case law that will be of interest to all of us. Please remember that this webinar is of a general nature only and is not medical advice or legal advice. You should consult your own attorney for legal advice and consult your own physician for any medical advice you seek about food allergies or any other medical conditions. If you have questions during the presentation, you can enter them into the questions box on the GoToWebinar platform that is displaying on your device. At the end of the presentation, we'll be answering questions as time allows. Today's webinar is being recorded. You will receive a follow-up email within a few days, and it will have a link to the video of recording as well as to a list of resources that we may suggest to you as further reading material. Um, and after the Allergy Law Project's presentation, we will stop to give away some wonderful gifts from our corporate supporters, Dr. Lucy and Sunbutter. The recipients of those gifts will be randomly picked from those still in attendance later in the webinar. And when we end the webinar, you will see a survey. Please share your impressions with us as we take your feedback very seriously to help improve the future direction of our webinar series. And we also give that feedback to our presenters because they're really interested to know how they've done and how you appreciated their um, presentations. So next, I'm going to introduce you to the Allergy Law Project. The Allergy Law Project was the idea of attorney, author, and food allergy advocate Laurel Francoeur Esquire in mid-2014. Uh, Laurel approached fellow attorneys who were also parents of children with food allergies, Mary Vargas Esquire and Homa Woodrum Esquire, about creating a space online where allergic individuals could find accurate information about the intersection of law and food allergy. The mission of the Allergy Law Project is supporting equal access and safe inclusion of individuals with food allergies under the law. You can find the bios of each of these impressive attorneys speaking here today on the Allergy Law Project website, www.allergylawproject.com. Thank you for joining us today, Laurel, Homa, and Mary. Um, let's get started. Thank you, Linda, for that wonderful introduction. Um, I wanted to start by thanking you also for all you do with Kids with Food Allergies and AFA. We're so grateful for this opportunity and also want to give a special thank you to Allison and Zero and Melanie Carver for their behind the scenes coordination of this webinar. Um, thank you, of course, to those who support KFA by listening, sharing, and being there for one another in the allergy community. Um, just to give you a little bit more background about us, Laurel is an attorney based in Massachusetts and she really brought us all together as Linda mentioned. She's written extensively about allergy law on the local and national level, which allowed her to see the need for an independent online allergy law resource. Um, Laurel attended MIT, and while some families discuss football and the parade on Thanksgiving, hers was discussing ge geometry. Mary Vargas's legal practice actually focuses on disability rights, and she is licensed to practice in Connecticut, Maryland, and D.C. federal court. The Vargas family has epic Halloween costumes, and Mary is also an avid baker. She's baked not just one, but multiple wedding cakes, which I find particularly awesome, and certainly something the rest of us allergy parents can relate to. My name is Homa Woodrum. I'm based out in Nevada, and I practice in guardianship, some states we call a conservatorship, as well as estate planning, probate, immigration, civil litigation, and family law. My personal pet projects, so to speak, are in the areas of labeling and affordable access to epinephrine. I use the phrase with complete honesty when I say I want to be like Mary and Laurel when I grow up. They're both incredibly smart and kind human beings, and working with them is a real treat. Now to move on to some disclaimers. 
because lawyers and disclaimers go together like sun butter and jam, I want to start with some preliminary information that you should also think about in your general interactions online. If someone is presenting you with information and they're not also being careful about their role and their representations about their role, it should, it should raise questions for you. Um, as Linda mentioned, our mission is supporting equal access and safe inclusion of individuals with food allergies under law. And it's a short phrase, but it has a lot of meaning to us. We use it as a guiding principle behind the scenes when we're writing articles or responding to emails because our goal is that we would never take a position adverse to the allergic individual. This doesn't mean that we agree with all positions that an allergic individual might have or make, but it means that we're going to take it from a position of support and education and not necessarily be chatting about how we would do it differently or what our perspectives are. Um, also, we are not a law firm and our activities are not meant to be advertisements for our respective practices. This is, again, something that we're ethically required to make sure that listeners or people who interact with us via email are aware of. Um, it's kind of, if, you're in a, if you meet a physician at a party and you have, ask him about a cough you've been having, he wouldn't go back to his office and create a chart for you. With lawyers, our trade is so often just talking through problems with people that require us to make very clear when an actual client relationship has been started because we wouldn't want someone inadvertently relying on us and thinking, oh, it's taken care of or, oh, a deadline is going to be met. Um, by reading our site or interacting with us via email or even tuning into this webinar, you're getting information, but you're not our client. Um, we're very careful about perception. And as you heard earlier, the work we do is volunteered for through the Allerg Allergy Law Project, although we do have day jobs that often overlap. Mary and Laurel, for example, recently worked together on a case, and our policy is that when that happens, the person who isn't involved gets to decide how the story is reported on our website or Facebook page, if at all. Ultimately, um, we want you to just keep all that in mind as we share this information. We hope it's uh, especially instructive or even helpful to think about when you might want to reach out to an attorney um, navigating uh, the field of allergies. And with all that in mind, I'm going to yield the floor to the wonderful Mary Vargas. Thank you. Thank you so much, Homa. I am so happy to be speaking with you all today and talking about one of my favorite topics, which is allergy law. So food allergy law is, in many ways, a civil rights movement that it's at its very beginnings. And that's what, as a lawyer, makes it interesting and exciting and important. As a parent, it also might make it very confusing. So we're going to try today to, to shed a little light on what's going on in allergy law right now with the understanding that it's changing and growing day by day. So it isn't the rights that we're talking about that are new. Federal disability law has been around since at least 1973, so we're talking about more than four decades that federal laws have been on the books preventing discrimination on the basis of disability. So why is it a new civil rights movement or a civil rights movement at its beginnings? And the answer is because before 2009, courts were generally applying a very narrow definition of what it means to be an individual with a disability. And it wasn't just people with food allergies that were having their cases dismissed from court. It was people with all kinds of disabilities that courts were looking at and saying, you know what, the, the federal law doesn't really apply to you. Your, your disability isn't severe enough. It's not a substantial impairment. Or you can take medication to make it go away. And then in 2009, that changed. Um, the ADA Amendments Act came into effect. And this, depending on your view of the world, either clarified the definition of what it means to be a person with a disability or expanded the definition of what it means to be a person with a disability. But that's not the only reason, in my opinion, why this movement is now getting propelled forward. We're part of, or we're looking at, a generation where one in six kids has has food allergies. So there are large numbers of kids growing up in every community who are going to school, who are joining after school programs, who are traveling and eating out and even getting jobs with food allergies. And all of this raises questions about the rights that they have and the responsibilities that disability lawyers place on entities such as schools and employers restaurants, manufacturers, and others. And so allergy law touches on many, many other areas of law and life. So if we could please move to the next slide. 
as Homa said, um, we started Allergy Law Project. It was it was Laurel, Laurel's brainchild, and I think it was a wonderful idea that she had. Uh, we all saw there was a need for accurate and reliable legal information. Um, there is a huge amount of inaccurate and what I would call inflammatory legal information online. And this is my informal survey. My informal survey of legal advice online is if you go into a Facebook group and describe a situation where you or your child was denied accommodations or excluded, you are most likely to be told, file a complaint, that's discrimination. Well, maybe you should file a complaint, and maybe it was discrimination. But whether that was the right legal advice is complicated. Simply because a complaint could be filed doesn't always mean that it should be filed. Now, if you've ever asked a lawyer a question, you know the frustration of getting an answer that starts with, it's depend. it depends. But the truth is, law is not black and white. And especially when it comes to food allergy law, the answers to legal rights and questions about legal rights often do depend. They depend on the specifics of a person's disability, on the state where they live, on the type of activity that's an issue, and on numerous other um, variables that can't always be portrayed in a quick online um, conversation. And the truth is that a little knowledge in law can be dangerous. It can lead to destroyed relationships with schools. It can lead to legal rights being waived. And so for this reason, whether you're advocating for yourself or your child or a loved one, please be cautious in seeking or relying on advice from non-lawyers, however well-intentioned those people may be. Just as you wouldn't take medical advice from someone without a medical degree online, we'd strongly encourage you not to take legal advice from non-lawyers, especially online. There are free resources that are available if you have a question about legal rights. Every state has a protection and advocacy organization that specializes in representing the rights of individuals with disabilities. Sometimes they're called, for example, Disability Rights Nebraska or Disability Rights New York. You can Google the organization in your state and they will talk to you for free. Um, they're a terrific resource for parents um, of kids with food allergies and for adults with food allergies. Also, the United States Department of Justice and the Department of Education both have free hotlines you can call with questions. And we would encourage you to go to these sources first. So the reality of allergy law, and certainly our philosophy at Allergy Law Project, is that there's a far greater chance to change hearts and minds through education than there is through the courts and filing of complaints. But first, it's important to know what those rights are. So if we could please go to the next slide. There are essentially three federal laws that we hear about more than any others when it comes to um, food allergy law. The first one, parents of school-age kids know very well. It's Section 504 of the Rehabilitation Act. This is the law that um, came into being in 1973, so more than four decades ago. And it provides that any recipient of federal financial assistance, so not just an elementary school, but anyone that accepts federal funding, must provide equal access. They must provide accommodations to allow individuals with disabilities equal access. And so um, certainly, as I said, many K-12s, through probably most K-12 through schools, receive federal funding. But so do colleges and university, universities. So do some early childhood programs and preschools, um, most health care providers, and many recipients you might not even expect. For example, some hotels accept federal funding resorts, recreation programs. And as a condition of accepting those federal dollars, they're essentially signing a contract with the United States government that includes a commitment to make accommodations for individuals with disabilities. So Section 504, you hear about that a lot. Second is the ADA. The ADA and Section 504 are very similar. There's no requirement under the ADA that um, an entity receive federal financial assistance. Instead, the ADA ensures equal access to employment, to state and local governments, and to any place that's considered to be a place of public accommodation. 
also places of public accommodation are things like theaters, private schools, gyms, restaurants, hotels. Any place open to the public must be open to all. And probably the third law that we hear about the most in food allergy, or um, that we don't hear about but we should, is the Air Carrier Access Act. Many people with allergies have questions about what rights they have in the skies when they fly. And the reality is the Americans with Disabilities Act does not apply to airlines in the air. Instead, the Air Carrier Access Act applies, and the rights that are, are guaranteed are relatively limited. But, and Laurel will talk about this later, um, there is the opportunity to file complaints with the United States Department of Transportation if you experience discrimination while traveling because of food allergies. Now, many states, probably most states, also have state laws that apply to um, individuals with disabilities. And many of those laws are very similar to um, the Americans with Disabilities Act. Now, if we could please go to the next slide. So discrimination com can occur in many different settings, and federal law provides protections in, in many different settings, certainly in education, employment, and beyond. Now in education, um, and that's an area probably that most parents of food allergic kids are most familiar with, five, Section 504 in public education and for recipients of federal financial assistance assures that kids with disabilities have access to education. For kids with food allergies, this means learning in a safe place with immediate access to epinephrine and with full inclusion, as in they're included in all of the activities that other children are provided access to. Federal disability, though, also applies to education, early childhood education, so preschools and colleges. And to give some examples of um, real life situations where um, education law applies in these settings, some of you may be familiar with the United States Department of Justice settlement with La Petite Academy. This was a settlement where a child was denied entry into a daycare program because they needed epinephrine. And the settlement resolved the complaint and required that the daycare center um, allow the child in and be willing to administer epinephrine in the event of an allergic reaction. On the opposite end of the spectrum, many of you may have heard about um, the complaint filed against Lesley University that was settled in the last year or two. And that was a complaint where college students sought investigation by the Department of Justice of Lesley University um, because of the um, dining program that they were required to pay, pay into and be a part of, but which they couldn't um, enjoy because of um, an inability to eat gluten and food allergies. So those are some real, real life examples in the education context. Federal law also provides protection in employment, and it, it says specifically that you cannot discriminate on the basis of disability when it comes to job application procedures, to hiring, to advancement or discharge of employees, to compensation, to job training, and then to other terms, conditions, and privileges of employment. Now, only talking about details that are public information, um, the most recent example of um, discrimination cases in the employment context is a case that I have personal involvement with. And this is Maldonado versus Panera. And this is a case where um, a food allergic assistant manager at a Panera restaurant alleges that he was subjected to um, severe and pervasive bullying and deliberate exposure to his allergens by not only coworkers, but by his, um, his superiors, by his general managers. And so um, we'll probably be hearing more about that case in the coming, um, in the coming months. But the ADA and other federal laws apply elsewhere. They apply, um, for example, in summer camps and recreation programs, as I mentioned, in hotels. And the law provides that entities that are open to all cannot discriminate on the basis of disability in the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations that they offer. Um, best example I can think of this is a recent settlement with the United States Department of Justice. There was a child with epilepsy who had repeatedly sought to attend a summer camp called Camp Bravo. This was in Maryland. 
And this child, not unlike a child with a food allergy, needed to be in a program where adults were willing to administer seizure medication in the event that she had a seizure. The United States Department of Justice entered into a settlement agreement with Camp Bravo that would require them going forward to do just that, to administer um, epilepsy medication in the event that a, a child attending their program had a seizure. And that also requires them to um, have non-discrimination statements in, in all of their materials online and elsewhere. And so, as you can see, there, there are many different places where, um, where food allergy law touches. And um, we can talk some more about specific cases in a few minutes with Laurel. But at this point, if we could go to the next slide, I'm going to pass the baton to our next speaker. Thank you, Mary. Um, so yes, I'm going to talk about some specific cases that we have covered um, on our website, Allergy Law Project. And as Mary said, this is an evolving area of law. So what these one particular cases say today might not be what the law is tomorrow. Um, and also, you have to understand that some of these issues go back before the Americans with Disabilities Act was amended, and some are after the. the so that may affect what applies. But anyway, moving on. So the Gleason case. So this is Gleason versus United Airlines, and it's a fairly recent case out of California. And a woman was flying from Florida to Chicago with a severe peanut allergy. Before she boarded the plane, she asked for an announcement. Would they refrain from people having nuts on the plane? And they said, yes, they would. However, when she got on the flight, the flight crew refused to make the announcement. One hour into the flight, she started having a reaction. She noticed that someone four rows behind her was eating something with peanuts. So she started getting symptoms, um, including falling in and out of consciousness and having strider, which is a particular asthma type wheeze. So she took her Benadryl and her inhaler. Question as to whether she took EpiPen. Um, the, the defendants say she didn't. The plaintiff just says she took medicine. So not sure whether she took epinephrine, but she at least took Benadryl and inhaler. A nurse who was a passenger came over and started helping and realized that she was not going to make it to the flight to Chicago. So they had to make an emergency landing in Missouri, and she spent two days in intensive care. So she sued the airline. And she sued for negligence, for emotional distress, and for a breach of contract, the contract being that they agreed to make this announcement and they failed to do so. Unfortunately, her case was dismissed. Two reasons. One, the Americans with Disabilities Act does not apply to airlines, as, as Mary said. It, it doesn't apply to airline flights. Um, so she wasn't able to argue that um, the Air Carrier Access Act does apply to flights. However, there's a provision in that law that says people cannot sue an airline if they fail to make an accommodation. So Air Carrier Access Act, the airline has to make an accommodation, but if they don't do so, the individual has no right to sue. So she wasn't able to uh, advance her, compla her complaint based on the fact of discrimination. So she again went for these uh, uh, things like negligence, emotional distress. Well, unfortunately, those were thrown out as well. The court held that a bill called the Airline Deregulation Act, which was implemented several years ago um, when airlines were first starting to proliferate and things were getting were still confused as to who had what rights and um, basically when the airline industry was first uh, blooming, this law came into effect. But there's a provision in that law that says that no state can enact a law related to the service of an air carrier. So what happened was the federal court in this case decided that her claims of negligence, emotional distress, and breach of contract were all related to the service of the air carrier. And therefore, they were trumped under the federal law of this Airline Deregulation Act. So her case was dismissed. In addition to her case being dismissed, the airline asked that she pay their costs for the lawsuit. And the airline was ultimately awarded costs. So 
uh, Ms. Gleason had to pay almost $10,000 to the airline. So not only did she lose the case, but she also had to pay United uh, because she lost the case. So what this, we have right on here a call for change. What this talks about is that there really has to be something done. We need to have food allergic passengers have more rights. Um, they shouldn't be uh, discouraged from filing lawsuits by saying that we have to pay for the defendant's costs if we lose. Um, right now there is a bill um, that is uh, in the federal government that um, would require airlines to uh, have epinephrine. Right now they only have syringes of epinephrine, but it would require them to have EpiPens on board and also uh, requiring that the government do an analysis of airlines and what their practices are and so forth. Um, but that hasn't passed yet, and right now we're sort of stuck with cases like this one um, that basically really limit our rights to sue. So next slide. So the Van Halen case. So you're probably familiar with the band Van Halen. Well, the ex-wife of the drummer of Van Halen has a child with allergies. She put that child in school program um, that costs thirteen thousand dollars a year um, so after two years of being in that program they discovered that the child had a nut allergy so they went the parents went to the headmaster and said we have a child now who has a nut allergy we need you to restrict nuts especially in the classroom and also to provide access to epinephrine and have someone trained in the use of epinephrine the headmaster agreed and said he would put in a policy that restricted nuts and that he would train people in the administration of epinephrine. However, that was not the case. The teachers and other staff basically refused to enforce the nut restrictions and had people in the classroom eat nuts anyway. Um, and when it came to the issue of the epinephrine, staff and teachers told uh, Ms. Van Halen that they would not administer EpiPens because it was a Christian science preschool and they did not believe in administering medicine. So they had no idea why uh, the headmaster had made these things, but then he was since, he was since dismissed. And uh, the school refused to, to do the things that it had promised, mainly training for EpiPens and putting in nut restrictions. So Van Halen sued. Now, she didn't sue on the basis of the Americans with Disabilities Act or on the basis of 504. Instead, she sued on breach of contract, emotional distress, and fraud. So basically, her argument was the headmaster promised these things, and then they reneged on that promise, and it created an unsafe environment and caused a lot of emotional dismiss, distress. The case was originally dismissed, but then it went to the appeals court, and the appeals court overturned the decision of the earlier court. And they said basically that the school had in fact placed her in a dangerous environment, that they had lied about making it safer, and that they failed to take any steps to address a medical emergency that might arise from the nut allergy. The court even went so far to say this is beyond what a civilized society will tolerate. So the court allowed Van Halen to go forward with her suit and um, again for breach of contract, fraud and emotional distress. I just researched the case and a decision just came down um, that the case is now going to be sealed. There's been a settlement in the case, um, undisclosed how much the settlement is, but um, this, is, this is interesting because originally the case was dismissed and it wasn't until she appealed it that she was able to go forward and now there has been a settlement. Um, but again, it, that's going to be uh, under seal, so we won't know the, the actual uh, results of that settlement. So next case. The Girl Scouts case. So this was a girl who um, is deaf, and she was involved in the Girl Scouts. For some reason, the Girl Scouts had provided her an interpreter but stopped. So I don't know why they stopped providing her the interpreter. It's unclear what the reason was but uh, they stopped providing her her interpreter so that she could participate in the events. Her mother complained and the troop ended up disbanding and they started a new troop where she was not included. 
So the main question in this case was, does 504, the law that Mary was talking about earlier, does that apply? The issue was that this is a private member organization. So even though the Girl Scouts received federal funding, the question that the court had to grapple with was whether just receiving federal funding was enough to, to qualify them under 504, or because they were a private member organization, they had to go through the analysis of was the Girl Scouts principally engaged in events like education, housing, social services, or parks and recreation. So in, if the Girl Scouts had only received federal funding and had not engaged in any of these uh, things, they may not be able to file a case under 504. So the Girl Scouts, in their defense, claimed that the activities that they did for the girls were not primarily or principally uh, education or social value. So it's interesting that um, the Girl Scouts who advertise themselves, and this was brought up in the case, as an inclusive uh, organization that seeks to educate girls and to provide them with social opportunities would deny this in a pleading. Uh, but the court actually, there is a chance that they do principally engage in these activities, and so therefore the case has been allowed to go forward. So this is important for food allergy, even though it involved the deaf community, it inv it's important to food allergy because the question of whether a private member organization, like the Girl Scouts or the Boy Scouts, that receive federal funding, does that bring them under the umbrella of 504? And so this case goes far in, in helping us to determine whether they do or not. And um, whether the, the plaintiff ultimately prevails um, is to, remains to be seen, but at least the case was not stopped in its track. This judge realized that there could be the possibility that 504 would apply in this case. So next slide. P.F. Chang's case. So a woman in California sued P.F. Chang's. Um, she had celiac disease and she claimed that they were charging her extra for items on the gluten-free menu. So what she was able to show was, for instance, they had a spinach salad at P.F. Chang's that was one price on the regular menu, and then when it was on the gluten-free menu, it was a dollar more, even though it had the exact same ingredients in both menus. So she was saying that basically this was a surcharge and she was being discriminated against because she had to pay more for the items on the gluten-free menu. Originally, her case in federal court was dismissed. The judge in that case ruled that, well first he said it was an alleged disability, that her celiac disease, and he said it was more on par with those who are on a diet and are, or are having simple dietary restrictions rather than an actual disease or medical condition. The judge went on to say that he didn't think that charging more for gluten-free menu items was uh, discrimination because he said that they have to be prepared separate from other items to avoid cross-contamination. So it, it involves more work on the part of the restaurant, so they're entitled to charge the extra money for that. When the case was dismissed, the judge did give the plaintiff in the case uh, the right to refile her case. But he did say when he gave her the right to refile that he had real reservations about whether she would be able to, to move forward even if she amended the complaint. Well, she amended the complaint and went back again to the same judge. The defendants uh, tried to, move, to dismiss the case again. This time the case was upheld. And it was the exact same judge who had thrown out the case and who said he had reservations about whether the case should go forward but this time he was convinced. And he was now convinced that celiac really is a disease. Um, the plaintiff brought in more evidence about celiac disease, including that it has a genetic component. So that seemed to sway the judge to think, OK, celiac disease may be really a, a disability more than a dietary restriction. Um, and uh, the, the plaintiff also said it's very simple. They just need to omit gluten. 
So the judge said, well, if it's just a matter of omitting gluten and not cross-contamination, then the dollar surcharge is not justified because P.F. Chang's does omit certain spices for people. Um, they omit, um, omit other ingredients for dietary restrictions. So the judge said, well, if it's just a matter of removing gluten from the items, then that may not justify the $1 charge. Um, and the question in this case was, well, whether P.F. Chang's had any obligation to provide gluten-free menus in the first place. And basically the judge went back to a Department of Justice a statement, which basically says that a restaurant may not have to change their menu at all if it turns out to be a fundamental alteration of the way they do business. Um, basically, the Department of Justice says that the restaurant only has to offer equal access, and um, if they do not make any substitutions for other people, or if it would substantially harm their or their restaurant to do so, they don't have to. And the uh, the example that the Department of Justice um, gave was about a bookshop and Braille books. So a bookshop has to allow disabled people to come and have access to their books, but they may not have to provide Braille books. Buy the Braille books, they may be able to charge more because they're more expensive. So that argument was made to the P.F. Chang case that P.F. Chang doesn't have to adjust their menu and if it does cost them more they may have to charge more. However, the judge in re-looking at this case said that P.F. Chang does make accommodations for other, other people such as vegetarians, um, taking away spices from certain things. So therefore, they have already opened themselves up to being able to make these small adjustments without causing a fundamental burden on them. So if the plaintiff can now show that just removing gluten would be enough to satisfy uh, her complaint and that that would not justify the $1 charge, then maybe the, um, the complaint uh, could then go forward. So again, what this basically is saying is that the, the case is not going to be dismissed. It will ultimately go to either a judge or a jury, as these other cases that we discussed will do as well. The ultimate decision in the case may not be favorable to the plaintiff. It may be favorable to P.F. Chang's. We don't know. But all we know is that with these cases, judges have said either they can go forward or they cannot go forward. And so that's basically uh, what we have to rely on when we're analyzing whether someone has enough to bring a case, whether it would, we would whether a judge would look at this and say, yes, there's enough of a question that it can go to a jury, or no, there's just no way it could. So hopefully through these cases you've seen that it is an evolving area, that nothing is, is really settled. Even one judge can even reverse his, himself on the issue, and that's why uh, we find this area so interesting. So I will turn it over to, I believe it's Homa. Thank you, Laurel. I appreciate that. And now kind of on to a, a hot button issue, which which taps into, some, you know, things like the P.F. Chang's case. We've got food. We've got everything from labeling to restaurant access to bringing outside food, and the the questions we get through our emails, through our Facebook page, a lot of them are really about food at the heart of it. Um, what I want to start with as far as labeling goes is that uh, there was a case recently filed and it is against the supermarket chain Publix. Um, I don't believe we have them on the West Coast, but it's generally on the East Coast. And what happened was a young boy and his family um, he was 11 years old and they went to Publix and they were selecting some treats at the bakery counter and at that counter the you know it, it looked like a bakery in your usual grocery store way there's bread and cookies and things in a display and there's things that appear to be ovens and warming implements and mixing implements behind the counter and um, Derek's family said to the individual working there 
okay, what, what's in this particular cookie or does this particular cookie have nuts? I mean, obviously I don't know the specific wording and they were, they were assured that this particular chocolate cookie didn't have nuts. And even um, the young boy's aunt broke the cookie open after purchase, saw that it didn't have nuts and offered it to him. And she even tasted it, I believe. And unfortunately, Derek experienced anaphylaxis and, um, and he passed away. I mean, he was only 11 years old. And the main thing was that in terms of legal procedure, you have the family filing suit. So they filed a complaint and in part what they were seeking was that this doesn't happen to another family. And that's something that I find even in my own practice, that most often when people have been wronged in terms of being, um, whether intentionally or inadvertently served an allergen after they've disclosed it in some way, they, they really want to protect other people. So that sometimes we, we have a knee-jerk reaction to litigation and say, oh, America is litigious. But at the same time, these people are often looking for remedies that are are not in the scope of money. This is, you know, obviously you do have damages, you do have those requests that you're allowed to make under the law, but I don't think that we can ever judge or assume that someone is, is looking is looking at these outcomes with with an intent that um, that is monetary or purely monetary. So they filed suit and usually the very first thing that happens when you file a lawsuit is the other side tries to make it go away. And so there was a motion to dismiss. The, the exciting component of the decision that came down is that um, the argument from Publix was, well, we don't have to make these disclosures. This is sort of at their own risk. We, there was a special exception that if you're offering baked goods, you're exempted from certain labeling requirements. So that's why so many food allergy families say, look, I'm just not going to try um, buying baked goods at a bakery. But um, the judge really um, heard the argument of the plaintiff and said, well, look, you're, you've got all the trappings of a bakery. You're doing things to induce this purchase. You're trying to lure someone to make a purchase, and this may not be honest or upfront, and, and the ramifications are, are severe. And you'll find that theme comes up in a lot of the trending issues in, in labeling law when we're talking about cross-contamination, when we're talking about the representations that are being made to us. because the, 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 the default of just not eating anything anybody prepares, it's, it's not feasible, it's not realistic, and frankly, it's not fair when you consider that um, even as parents, we're not always going to be there to read the labels, to make the phone calls. Um, even, even teen groups as an age, as an age group, they take risky behaviors. We know that. We need to be able to um, ensure that they are empowered with information that can keep them safe. So, so I think the thing with Publix is not only that, but the, the, the judge took it another step and there were arguments that Publix had, this cookie was not baked by Publix. It turned out that all of their baked goods, with the exception of a few things, are baked off-site. So even though they have the trappings of a bakery, they're not really a bakery. So when these people think that they're talking to someone who actually mixed the ingredients, they're not. It's not the same as talking to the chef at a restaurant and saying, okay, what kind of oil do you use or what's in your spice mix? you know, to, to get that level of comfort that you maybe have when you're eating out. So the cookie in question actually may have been a, a cookie that was later recalled for some cross-contamination issues, and all Publix had done is purchased it or used it, uh, the cookie that was wrapped elsewhere in the store, and placed it in the bakery case and pretended that it was for sale as a baked good that they had generated. So there's a lot of things concerning about the actions of the grocery store, the disparity of power, the, the information that we don't have that we're desperately trying to get. And I think that leads into labeling because we have, you know, we have what we call FALCPA, the Food Allergen Labeling and Consumer Protection Act. And it was it was a huge step. I mean, I think that that's it's hard when we're dealing with label frustrations. We say to ourselves, "Oh, this isn't enough. This doesn't actually help." How many times have we had to put a, a a good back on the shelf because oh, there's some ingredients listed, and then there's that horrible catch-all, uh, shared facility, or we're not making any promises about this product, or eat at your own risk. You know, those sorts of things that that you know to the to those of us that deal with allergies in our family just read like go away. We're not interested in your money. We're not interested in your patronage. And the thing with, with FALPA is that there are kind of two schools of thoughts about the way it's written. One school of thought says, look, it's built into this, this legislation is the means to expand 
through regulation. And that's in federal law, sometimes you have the base law and then you have agencies that are given the power to make um, regulation. So in the case of FALPA, we have the FDA. And um, for sesame labeling, it's, it's, um, it's an allergen that a lot of us deal with. It's, it's in the U.S. it's not considered a top 8 allergen. In Canada it is. Um, it's part of the, you know, the, the top allergens there, so it's obviously kind of trending. But that's not to say that corn or, or any other ingredient that we deal with, you know, in terms of frustration as disclosure or non-disclosure or safety, um, you know, that any of these are less important. But it's, it's an interesting test case because what successfully was done with Falcpa in terms of regulation was that there was a red dye that was generated from an insect and that it actually is highly allergenic for some people and there was not necessarily a disclosure of it. And um, CSPI, the Center for Science and the Public Interest, over a very long period of time, I believe it was about 10 years, were able to petition successfully the FDA to create sort of the regulatory framework that would just make it that, that um, companies had to disclose the use of that uh, that quote unquote natural ingredient. And the interesting thing is that in, in forcing them to do so, ultimately many of them just pulled it because you're going to read a label and you don't really want to eat that strawberry yogurt that, you know, it's the redness doesn't come from the strawberries, it comes from this insect. It's it's, you know you can see where the pushback from the industry comes from on these, these regulations. So the sesame process has been winding its way through, but um, excitingly, on November 23rd, so just last month, at the end of last month, we have um, HR 4061, which is titled the Food Labeling Modernization Act of 2015. And that's the second approach. So we've got this regulatory approach, and then we've got the legislative approach. Is how are we the law to sort of Force the force this labeling process to move forward, and there's some you know there's some exciting things in there. Sesame obviously is mentioned, but again, the frustration that I know we all deal with, and it even legally is murky, is is these shared equipment warnings, these these um, these disclosures that are not required. So how can you rely on them? Um, you know, and then ultimately the law hasn't quite played out what our responsibilities are. I mean, we can talk generally about products liability and say okay, well, what's implied by this product, what warranties are, are being made, and I know these are legal, kind of legalese terms, but I think that you can see how the neat thing to me, I guess, is about the law is that we've got these rising issues and, and the law can make room for them. We just have to be able to make the arguments and say, okay, well this is really similar to someone promising X, Y, and Z about their product and, and, and is it appropriate? The frustration obviously being that, you know, a company could just say, this just happens to contain other allergens which we're not going to tell you about or this is proprietary or this is secret. I mean, I know in my own experience I've contacted major companies about ingredients of, of things that should be really obvious, like ketchup, and you're told, no, you better not eat our product, you better not buy our salsa. And that's and that's hard because we're we're just trying to to make our way in the world. So I think I think the exciting thing when you see this dual pronged approach is that um, is that we have um, we have regulatory efforts that are trying to make headway because if we if we blaze the trail for that, we'll be able to blaze the trail for other allergens. And um, and that kind of leads us into restaurants. Uh, Laurel had mentioned the P. F. Chang's case, and um, you know, and then we've also got a Massachusetts restaurant law. And I believe there's some other states that have laws similar that require actually staff training, uh, displays regarding appropriate allergen handling procedures, and even disclaimers on menus or in the space that would say you need to disclose to your server if you have an allergy. You need to, you know, you need to make that um, that information available. Now there's a second part of the Massachusetts restaurant law that talked about creating a list of restaurants, allergy friendly restaurants, but again, you know, in the legal standing, you say to yourself, well, what kind of affirmative obligation is that creating? If I advertise, if, if I'm not just giving people information about what's in their food, but I'm actually promising them, oh, this is a safe place to eat, that's a, that's a kind of a scary promise. And they have to think about it, you know, as frustrated as we get, we have to think about it as, well, even me as, as a mom who maybe is baking a cookie without 
sesame or without oats or without peanuts or tree nuts for my daughter, I would never ever presume to offer that baked good to another person's child, let alone one who had allergies, because I know what decisions I made in every step of the process, you know, such as what flour I use or where my pans have been or what's going on with my oven, um, you know, or even people who could tolerate baked egg or whatever, what they what their comfort levels are. And and I think that in restaurants it's it's a huge responsibility, but it's a food safety issue. It's kind of like going back to the school question of oh hand washing. It benefits everybody. Disclosure benefits everybody. And that's why maybe I'm being overly optimistic, but the trends to disclosure are going to are going to push forward. And if we continue to make it clear to our, our legislators and and others that that we want this information, um, I think that it's it's going to happen. Like the successful progression of um, gluten disclosure. I mean, it's it's exciting to see these things succeed, and that's why we have to be a team with other areas or other you know with the celiac community or other communities because they're going to be making these these inroads. Now, to kind of get into some other other areas, such as um, family law, we can go to the next slide. And um, and this I kind of find interesting, and, and I know it comes up for, for a lot of people in my practice, is, well, you're, everything's fine, you're with your spouse or your partner or significant other, and you're raising a child together, and suddenly things break down. Communication's not working, um, you know, and and there's a loss of trust often, and you have a situation in person. Maybe dad was the one who was, on, or dad was the one who was meeting with the doctor, and suddenly we're in a situation where you're dividing responsibility for a child, and you can have differing opinions. I mean, I get I get questions all the time of, well, I want my child to carry. So here's an example, both epinephrine injectors, but my husband just or my ex-husband just takes one. I mean. This, for, for those of us that know, I mean, you should have two. You should always have two. There's a reason they're in two packs, and there's, it's medically supported. So, you know, what do you do in a court setting about that? And it kind of rewinds back to the beginning of any case for custody, which is you want to document, document, document. You want to make sure that you have support for your positions. Now, I understand there's instinct and there's preference, and there's going to be there's going to have to be wiggle room. But if you've got your physician or allergist who's able to say, look, I prescribed this. I prescribed, for example, two injectors for this child because they are meant to carry two injectors. And then the key in terms of enforcement is you need to make sure that those things are ending up in the orders from the court or the settlements you're signing. I mean, hopefully, you're going to be in a situation where you can come to the table and mediate these disputes. So I think that it's very key to, to make that paper trail, even if things are going great, because suddenly, you know, things change and you want to be able to have this guiding document that you can rely on. Now as far as torts, it's not the cake, it's uh, a civil wrong. And, and you're looking at negligence, you're looking at um, negligence is where someone doesn't take a reasonable uh, standard of care and employ it. So is someone is someone doing something potentially recklessly that causes that causes harm? And that could overlap in, for example, you know, improper cleaning in in a food establishment, you know, and then it exposes someone to an allergen. I mean, these are things that are going to come. These cases will come. We're in a very new area, um, as Mary mentioned. And then again, bullying. It, it, it's it's a huge issue, and I think that it's hard because you've got a child who maybe doesn't just wants to be out of the situation and doesn't want to be in that situation. For example, I was bullied in school and my parents' response was to put me in homeschool. And that's what worked for them. But at the same time, you know, you have to balance the emotional and mental health of the child with um, with other factors. Or even in the case Mary was mentioning about um, Maldonado versus um, Panera, you can experience it as an adult. You absolutely can. And, and the key as a community is that we, we don't want to shame people about being the victim of um, these kinds of things. And I'm going to end with a little bit of criminal law because there was, uh, even this summer, there was a case in, in Washington that settled where a young man had been detained um, regarding some charges and he um, he was served some oatmeal that, that contained an allergen and he disclosed that, but obviously they either didn't take him seriously It was um, and it was really unfortunate because he experienced a reaction and they didn't even believe him um, and he passed away and there was a settlement with his family ultimately, but again, money is not really the outcome of these cases, it's awareness and, and frankly, 
you have to remember the Eighth Amendment um, right to be free from cruel and unusual punishment attaches to inmates. So when you're being detained or accused of a crime, um, what happens is that you are you do have a right not to be punished or treated as if you're guilty, but that's not necessarily the Eighth Amendment that they're looking at. Um, inmates have a right to complain about prison conditions. Disabled prisoners are entitled to assert their rights under the Americans with Disabilities Act, so you can kind of see how this reaches out um, you know, into other fields. And they're also entitled to medical care, so I, I think it'll be interesting to see if we end up with stock epinephrine reaching out into, into prisons. I think that that could um, that could come up quite a bit. And then also criminal intent. There was a case where a business person was buying regular bread and packaging it as gluten-free and intentionally selling it to people at farmers markets. I mean, he was injuring people in an intentional way. And I think that there, you know, and there's there's definitely a criminal component to some of this activity. Um, and then obviously intentional acts such as knowing someone has an allergy and using that to cause them harm. I think that we'll unfortunately potentially see these cases coming up more and more as people age and as public perception of food allergies maybe doesn't improve. So as far as our final thoughts, um, we, we caution people to um, stay informed to, you know, all of these cases are ongoing. Just knowing that, oh, this Modernization Act is coming for labeling doesn't necessarily mean that um, this is the law and you have to watch that carefully. And, and Mary always likes to say, you have to speak softly. You want to be a team. You want to try to effectuate change in a non-adversarial way because I think you can you can leverage that for adults and children alike in the future. And I think we have questions now. Sorry, I don't know how much time we have. Okay, I found out I was muted. <laughs> so um, I just wanted to say thank you so much for um, your wonderful presentation. All three of you just really are wonderful with the way you share what you know and you make it so relevant to those of us who are raising children with food allergies. Um, and we do have questions, but it's two minutes before two and I want to respect everybody's time. So. Um, unfortunately, I think I'll just skip past the questions, even though I know a lot of you will be disappointed about that. Um, so go ahead to the next slide now. Okay, um, wrapping up for what we are doing today, I just want to remind you that Kids with Food Allergies is a nonprofit charity. We're a div division of the Asthma and Allergy Foundation of America. Today happens to be Giving Tuesday, and until a cure is found, we provide practical support that gets families through each day. Um, you can change lives and support our work by donating at kidswithfoodallergies.org. Um, so thank you so much for that. And then I believe next we have giveaways. We have two giveaways from Sun Butter and two from Dr. Lucy. The winner for Sun Butter is Brandy Stillens and Ellen Carlin. And the winners for Dr. Lucy's are Sarah McGrath and Mark Sable. Thank you all for joining us and for um, for being here today to attend this webinar. Um, Mary wanted me to share with you that um, I they will be writing a post about rights in restaurants and because they know there is much interest in that topic and you can be free free to contact um, them through the Allergy Law Project website. Um, and don't forget to like their Facebook page and also to go to allergylawproject.com and sign up for the um, notifications of their new blog post because I know not only will you want to read the new ones, but you'll probably want to look through their um, recent ones that they've published this past year because there's a lot of interesting stuff there that goes in a lot more detail than what they were able to share with you here today. Um, so in closing, you know, it's holiday season, lots of allergens around and family situations and other activities to navigate. So please stay safe this holiday. Be prepared for anaphylaxis. Know your emergency plan. Check your epinephrine auto injectors. Make sure they're current and that you have them with you at all times for your child. Um, and if you need some educational information about anaphylaxis, epinephrine, food allergies, anything like that, we have it all on our website. Everything is free. 
We also have resources for the holidays. Um, you can get some food and cooking help on our forums. We also have a food and cooking blog with a lot of substitutes that you can find, like cream of mushroom soup that's dairy-free and egg-free. Um, so check out our blog. Um, it's just right on our website. And you can also um, access some great resources on navigating safely um, holidays like Hanukkah and Christmas. So please check those out. Once again, they're all free, and you can print out handouts for it if you'd like. So anyhow, thank you so much for joining us. Homa, Mary, Laurel, you did a wonderful job. I really sincerely appreciate it. Have a nice day, everyone. Bye.